Hey there. So this is the second video on conceptualizations of self that I'll be posting. If you haven't watched the first one, I'd like to suggest you pop back and give that a quick listen, because that's a video in which I discuss simple conceptualizations of self, specifically how you look and what determines how you look in the mental realm or in the astral. And it sort of turned into a bit of a body image issue talk because I used that as an example of how sometimes unconscious, sometimes conscious, but occasionally toxic or unhelpful influences can creep into the way you imagine yourself. And I touched on how my realization that I was doing such things ended up influencing how I worked. But in this talk, I'm really not going to discuss how you picture yourself in the sense of what specifically you look like. But instead, I'd like to talk about how you can really violate rules of identity that exist in the material realm and fundamentally alter how you relate to yourself and your aspects of self while working in the mental plane. Now, the first thing I'd like to touch on is what your point of view is when working in the astral or in the mental. As with a novel, the scene can unfold from a first-person point of view or a third. There are obviously other options, but these are two of the most popular. First person is seeing everything from the eyes of the person experiencing it directly. In terms of visualization, that would be when you're working at your astral altar, do you see your astral altar as if from the eyes of your conceptualization of your own body there? If so, you would be able to see your arms. If you look down, you'd be able to see your body, but you have no view of your face. And when you interact with things at your altar, you're seeing the scene unfold in basically the exact same way that you go about bumping around life. Your consciousness is embedded within that astral body you've given yourself. That's a first person viewpoint. But when it comes to visualization, daydreaming, and work in the astral, you can also take a third person view which is to say you're watching yourself interact with objects. You can see the whole of your body, your face, and your point of view, how the scene unfolds before you, is capturing the entirety of that scene. Now, when I realized that I alternated between these two means of visualization, I thought it was pretty interesting and potentially had some interesting things to say about how I engaged with what I was doing. And my thoughts immediately turned to fiction writing as a way of explaining what might be going on. Because as a general rule in fiction, first-person narration means you have the closest possible relationship with the POV, the point of view character, but the only things that are seen or experienced, the only things that are related to the reader, are those things that that point of view character directly recognizes, notices, or engages with. Third-person narration, by contrast, puts a little bit more distance between the reader and the point-of-view character. In general, third-person means you have a slightly larger scope, and there is a bit of a barrier between the reader and the point-of-view character. The reader isn't embedded directly within that entity, and so may gain a little bit more objectivity, may be able to suss out a bit more of the scene or what's going on than they would in first-person. And instead of feeling like they're acting themselves, it feels more like you're watching somebody else act, albeit from a very close relationship or connection. And when it comes to astral work, I noticed that sometimes it was very difficult for me to get into a first-person point of view, as it were. Sometimes I just naturally approached everything from a third-person point of view. Alternately, there were times when first-person point of view just happened innately without any conscious decision on my part, and pulling out to a third-person point of view that is dissociating my consciousness from the embodiment that I'd given myself was very difficult. And after thinking about this a little bit, it occurred to me that there are benefits to each point of view that might help explain why I fell into one or the other at any given time. In first person, my ability to experience a rich sensory interaction with my astral environment is improved. 
anything that I'm doing in order to elicit or mimic an intense physical experience is easier to do in first person. It comes more naturally because I'm embedded right there. If I'm dancing, I feel myself dancing more when I am experiencing it from first person. When visualizing myself working from a third person point of view, that disembodiment, although it reduces the immediacy and the intensity of tactile experience, for instance, has the advantage of facilitating a sort of bleeding into my surroundings an intermingling of myself and the other objects and energies that are present on the scene. By removing my view from the confines of the form that I've given myself in the mental realm, I reduce that hard line of separation between myself and the things around me. And so although this form of distancing, if you're not careful, can reduce the emotional intimacy one experiences with the scene, it can also do the opposite. It can wrap everything together. So instead, really, there's a representation of yourself within the scene, but you feel more like the whole scene. And I think of this as expansive disembodiment. It's a form of dissociation. It allows you to sort of distribute your consciousness so that it touches on and enters the things around you, the things around you that are outside of that simple conceptualization of self that you have created. Now, playing around with these two points of view inevitably sort of led to a natural corollary that fuses both of them, which is to say that I began to work with different aspects of self that were embodied separately from a main body from which I viewed the scene. In essence, creating for myself on the astral a coven in which different parts of myself were sort of split off and given their own bodies, their own conceptualizations that capture the energies of those particular bits of myself and seeding my consciousness within one of those aspects creating a coven of one that I could work with and interact with directly from the point of view of myself within my own body on the astral, but whom I could also feel, albeit at a little more of a distance. So for instance, I might choose to separate myself into three aspects, one that is rawer, more instinctual, more closely tied to the animalistic origins from which we sprung. And on the other hand, splitting off bits of myself that were more the priestess archetype. You might think of it as higher self, that calm and centered and love-filled bit of self. Well, I could break her off and give her her own body as well. And all the parts of me that remained, well, I held on to those and wrapped them into its own conceptualization where I seeded my consciousness. And in here lies the majority of my power, the majority of my personality and historical shaping, and also naturally for myself, that bit that can interact with the material realm. Because I do bounce back and forth between working in the material and the mental. And so this part of me, that particular conceptualization of self, serves as the bridge that links my material altar to my mental one and through which everything must flow to get from one place to another. And this sort of dissociation really allows these different aspects of myself to work in parallel. And I found that it can be really quite surprising what each of these embodied sub-bits of yourself will add to ritual or add to your working. It can be quite unexpected because as dissociated entities, they, that is you, are really running with very little interference from the ego, as it were, which is embedded in the conceptualization of self, the individual that the rest of you embodies. And so in dissociation, you grant these parts of yourself the ability to work without interference, the ability to contribute in ways that aren't edited or censored, and I think in particular, this can be very helpful when you're splitting off parts of yourself that are usually underrepresented or underserved. Identities that are by and large silenced by the more powerful aspects of yourself that take center stage 90% of the time. 
I've also found it really interesting to sort of experience how these dissociated aspects of self work together and with what's left of me. For instance, seeing what parts of whatever ritual I'm working on naturally get taken over by one aspect or another, which aspect is calling the shots at any given time. Also seeing how the emotional tone changes when one aspect or another is calling the shots. What is it that they are inclined to do? And it can be quite inspirational and instructive to see just how far you're willing to let them run. Because in my case anyway, it's not always in a direction that I'm entirely comfortable with. But letting that aspect of self that is naturally inclined towards crossing a line, exploring beyond that line that I'm nervous about, can help carry me past the blocks and hesitation that keep me, the rest of me, the all of me from going there. One of the things I like a lot about these kinds of experiences is that they allow me to engage with aspects of self that we don't necessarily give the respect they deserve. Many of us spend a great deal of time and energy attempting to embody our higher selves, aspiring to reflect that aspect of ourself more fully in day-to-day -day life and in ritual. But I'm not really convinced that ignoring or suppressing baser instincts, baser desires and needs is really the right tack to take in attempting to do so. I like my feral qualities and there is a solid place for honoring them in my practice. These are the parts of me that want to come out and play and that I keep a leash on most of the time because, you know, I have to function. <laughs> I can't be that reckless or that extreme or that raw and still operate in consensus reality. And yet most of us recognize that when we suppress needs and desires, the pressure that builds up can become dangerous and detrimental. And those rawer aspects of myself house a lot of the intense emotional experiences that manifest in my life. And those emotions, even when they're negative or they're not conducive to playing well with others in day-to-day -day life, feeling that level of emotion is enjoyable to me. I want that. So welcoming those aspects of self into circle with me are a wonderful way of engaging with them. Now aside from seeding your own consciousness and experiencing the scene of working with other aspects of yourself from a first person point of view, simply from that one identity, you of course have the freedom to do other things. You also have the ability to shift consciousness and primary experience within that circle from one set of aspects of self to another. So you can leave the more ego grounded aspects of yourself in that form that you were previously encompassing and shift your consciousness into that raw set of aspects or shift from there to the aspects that encompass your higher self. And you can do this over the course of the ritual. Whoever is leading the show in that moment, you can seat yourself within them to experience those interactions firsthand and more directly. You can even dissociate yourself to a greater extent and so have this circle of aspects working together and seat your consciousness outside of them, taking that third person point of view, where the intensity is slightly diminished because you're external to what's going on and watching it as it were, but by distributing that consciousness, you can feel all of the aspects working together, how they interact with one another. And you may thereby find that this provides quite a lot of insight regarding how close these different aspects of yourself are to one another. Two sub-identities that may at first have seemed quite different, quite detached, having little in common, may be bound together quite strongly in an unexpected way. Additionally, those aspects of yourself that you feel most pulled toward can tell you something about what parts of your identity or of your shadow you're not engaging with that perhaps you should be. Another worthwhile exercise is using these different dissociated aspects of yourself to figure out which parts of you feel a deep natural affiliation with particular deities invoking a deity into a subset of yourself, into one of those aspects, can have really interesting consequences for the dynamics of how those different aspects of self work together. 
all of which is to say that the boundaries of yourself, what you think of as the line between yourself and the external, can be reshaped, shredded, or built up stronger in the mental plane in a way that we simply cannot pull off in the material but which we can carry back into the material by working with them in our minds, in the astral. When you reconsolidate all those aspects of self after your astral ritual and come away understanding a certain subset of your aspects more, you can consciously give them more leeway to act in your day-to-day life, in the material realm, because you've now given them a face, a shape. You've recognized their presence and are starting to get to know them more deeply and more intimately. And as you recognize those parts of yourself and what their strengths and weaknesses are, you may find yourself more able to recruit their aid when you need it, or to subdue them when they begin to act out in an inappropriate time and place. Anyway, I'd be really interested to hear how anybody listening engages with their own self during visualization or in the astral how you play with identity, or what experiences you've had involving dissociation on the astral. So until then, I hope you enjoyed the video and have a wonderful afternoon.